Um, I'm going to start today's sermon uh, by reading a piece that I wrote. It's a little bit um, intimate and vulnerable, all right? So I'm going to just bring you in real fast. (laughs) Uh, I wrote a piece about a year ago, and this is kind of a piece in reflection and lamenting my own kind of racial journey as an Asian American woman. It's called The Blood of the Land Cries Out. 30 years ago, my family stepped foot onto the stolen land. Oblivious to the history of brutality, the bloody hands and feet of those who walk it, we came for the American dream. A dream created for and by people who don't look like us and perpetuated by the oppressive forces of colonialism. It is a dream that obliterates all other existing dreams. A dream intolerant of collective thriving. A dream that demands from its dreamers death of the mind, spirit, and body. So we dutifully died. Little by little, we died to our pride in history. Hating the color of our skin, the sound of our language, the sacredness of our food. We died to our connection with family and land. We died to our old self and surrendered our lives to a white Jesus. We saluted to the flag of white supremacy and swore ourselves in as citizens of the United States. Dutifully complied to the deaths of other dark-skinned people. We turned on our family, unaware of the blood that is now on our own hands and feet. Yet... The blood has a way of testifying. The blood of the land cries out, just as the blood of Abel did. Our ancestors testified to the dead and the dying of this land. They testified of their brutal deaths as disposable laborers, as sex workers targeted for assaults and lynching, they testified of their courageous collective struggle for life and liberty. The blood of the land cries out, and we woke from our sleep. Model minority is a dream that demands death of its dreamers, a violent dream that salutes to white supremacy and wage war against collective thriving. The blood of the land washed over us and gave courage. It calls us to deep lament. The dried bones of the land resurrected, bone to bone, tendon to tendon, a vast army of us. We remembered. We remember our resilience, our history, our people, our family. We remember our creator and our destiny as warriors. We are our brother and sister's keeper. We do worship an awesome God. The blood of the land cries out. And we remember our dreams as family. Let me pray for us. Can I get some water first, though? Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for family. 
I thank you for resurrection. I thank you for waking us up. Our mind, our spirit, our bodies. And I thank you for your dream. I thank you for your dream for us. Lord, I ask that you would anoint my words and that you would um, go before me and make way that whatever needs to resonate and go deep would go deep. And whatever is not of you, um, may it be erased in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So thank you for receiving my peace. So in this piece, the American dream, or what I call the empire's dream, wages war against collective flourishing, collective thriving, right? It demands death of its dreamers. Yet the blood of the land testifies and wakes us from our sleep, right? It resurrects in us our original dream as kingdom family. I remember in one of the many deep, meaningful conversations I had with my adopted auntie, uh, Janet King. I don't know if he's here. She is she here? Yay! Um, auntie um, Janet is uh, of the Lumbee tribe. And in one of the conversations we had, she said, every new encounter across the globe is like a family reunion, whether people honor it, acknowledge it or not. So if we understand our familial ties as humankind or our ties to our creator as our first parent, um, if we saw everyone as our elder, as our auntie, uncle, our siblings, our babies, how would it challenge how we live out missions or ministry? How we think about international relations or domestic relations, right? How we interact with the criminal justice system, the education system, the immigration system. The dream of my family growing up was always to make sure that every family member had what they need in order to reach their fullest potential. Now, their perception of what we need and what our fullest potential uh, might be might not always look or sound kind of the most helpful, right, my family. Yet, nevertheless, that was their intention, right, that every family member would get what they need in order to reach their fullest potential, to contribute to society and to live in peace. Isn't that God's dream for us? as the global kingdom family, right? The collective flourishing of all people, that all members would have what they need, not only just to survive, but to thrive, right? To thrive, to become the best of who they were meant to be. And not only that, and for us to have each other's backs, right? To be in right and just relationships with each other, with the land, and with God, our first parent. The American dream, or the empire's dream, on the other hand, is always at war with this dream, right? It is a false sense of flourishing of a few at the expense of so many right? It is an illusion that upholds white supremacy. And it requires that we renounce our allegiance to our collective story, to our family, to ourselves, and to our creator. And it demands that we comply and become complicit to the empire systems 
of oppression, of greed, of dehumanization. When I moved to this country um, from a beautiful island called Taiwan at the age of nine with my sister and my mom, we were on a crash course to learn the new rules of survival. And we quickly learned that the color of our skin and our limited language somehow implied that we were not very bright. So people spoke at times very rudely and always very loudly as if that would help me understand the language better, right? And, and even though I tried my best to get rid of my accents and sound as American as I can, there was always still this assumption that somehow I'm not really from here. I don't really belong. And I also learned this expectation of me as an Asian American, a group that I didn't even know I belonged to until I came here, right, um, is one of a model minority. Now, I know that that came with some racial privilege, right? For the most part, and mostly East Asians, we are not a walking target to the police, right? We are not perceived as dangerous and criminal. Instead, we are the empire's compliant pawns. To uphold white supremacy and justify the oppression of other people of color. So under this model minority myth, I learn to be ashamed. I learn to be ashamed of my struggle as the first generation to go to college. I learned to keep silent, silent about my father's upbringing in poverty, in alcoholism and drugs, to be silent about my grandfather's criminal justice, or my aunt fallen victim to kidnap, rape, and forced marriage with a gang member. These were not the struggles of a model minority. So instead, I started to run run and turn away from family, turn away from our collective narrative in order to fit into the empire's narrative, the empire's dream for me. In the first account of murder in scripture, we see our creator putting self right in the middle of a homicide between two brothers. Cain grew jealous of Abel's favor with God, right? And Abel became the scapegoat for Cain's own sin, right? He was the source of why he did not have favor with God. So the dream of collective flourishing as family quickly turned into a dream of vengeance and power. Can we pull up the first slide? So here, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? But if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door, and its desire is for you but you must master it. So we later find out that Cain didn't really pay much attention to God's warning. Right? He missed that one. Uh, and he brutally murdered his brother. There is a way that sin breeds sin unless we disrupt it. Now, when we commit an offense, we can either pause and turn and repent. Or we can spend a whole lot of time and energy fooling ourselves to believe that what we did and what we thought was right. 
And this pattern of justification is the start of all conflicts and wars. Now, I know this is just me, but sometimes when I get into arguments with Javier, okay, right, I'm going there. Um, <laughs> I don't know, some of you know Javier, he's a very even kill person, right? So, I mean, his expression is kind of like default, always like this. So I'd be coming home like, oh my gosh, you, I can't believe this, I'm so excited, Javier. Do you know what just happened? This is so amazing. He'd be like, that's cool. <laughs> or I come home that's so mad, I'm like, I can't believe they did that. Can you believe that? That's not right. <laughs> so we get into this argument, right? And I am, I am mad and I'm mad and the conversation's getting heated and, you know, I'm just like, I can't believe this. You're such a, oh, I, right? And I say something and I see his default face and there's a little twitch and then a little frown and he's silent. And I'm like, I think that one hurt, right? So he's sitting there and I'm having this internal dialogue. I know it's just me, right? Having this internal dialogue and I'm like, what? I mean, seriously, I'm, really? Like, you, it's kind of true what I said. I mean, maybe not so much the character part, but I mean, he knows what I mean. And then I started thinking like, you know, maybe it's not totally true, but you know, when he didn't respond to me when I said that earlier, that is just as hurtful as what I just said. You know, he's always like that. Jeez, so insensitive. You know, I shouldn't be the one apologizing. You know, he, I, he should be apologizing to me right now. Javier's looking at me like, yep. <laughs> right with his face. Okay, so I know that's just me. No one can relate. So there is a way that we, or that I, can talk myself into justifying my offense, right? And this pattern of justification requires that we dehumanize the other person. And it's the start of all conflicts and wars. If we can pull up the next slide. It's an excellent book recommended by Pastor Donna. Um, it's called The Anatomy of Peace, Resolving the Heart of Conflicts by the Arbinger Institute. So it says, when I choose to act contrary to my own sense of what is appropriate, I commit an act of self-betrayal. And a choice to betray myself is a choice to go to war. Because when I betray myself, I create within myself a new need. A need that causes me to see others accusingly. I'm going to let you sit with that for a little bit. Now, this happens both in the micro and the macro level. right? The choice to betray our sense of what is appropriate in relating with kingdom family. Right? Our innate longing for what is right and just because we're created in God's image. The choice to betray is the choice to go to war. It will escalate and snowball because the Lord says, if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door and its desire is for you. So 
how have we seen the American empire go down this path? First, it was coveting the land and resources of family. Then, it was coveting free and cheap labor from family. Then you have to fabricate more lies and instill more policies to systematically, intergenerationally, across generations, justify the murdering and dehumanization of more family. You have to strategically craft your criminal justice system, your education system, your immigration system, your food system to make sure that family will never become family. But always treat it like an outcast, inferior and undeserving. And the victims, the victims like Abel, they quickly go from family to savages to criminals to enemies deserving of all kinds of ill treatments such as slavery and torture and genocide, imprisonment and all forms of oppression. Now at any point, we as a nation could have mastered sin's desire for us, right? At any point, we could have stopped and acknowledged our offenses and disrupt the war. But instead, we continue to erase, to sanitize, to manipulate our history, to hide the offense. And so the personal and state-sanctioned offenses due to racism and sexism and classism, homophobia, xenophobia, they keep evolving and escalating in new forms and shapes. Go to the next slide. When the Lord asked Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Really? <laughs> like, you really think you could pull this off with God? So the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Just because we disown family doesn't mean they stop being family. The Lord still holds us accountable for being our sister and our brother's keepers. The Lord received Abel back and then carries out justice. Right? God cursed Cain from the ground. Family, the land of this nation is drenched in blood. And the Lord has received back every single person that have died on this land and is carrying out justice. The blood of our ancestors cries out to the Lord and to us from the ground. And it not only testifies of the horrendous offenses and demands justice from the Lord, it testifies of the incredible victories and courage and resilience of our ancestors. The multi-race, multi-ethnic, multi-gender, spiritual, revolutionary saints the freedom fighters, right, who came before us and fought the good fight. 
the blood of the land heals. It gives courage. It awakens. It resurrects in us. Our creator's dream for us as family. Pay attention and listen. In my own journey of healing and awakening, I have come to remember my family's narrative in a new way. I am who I am and where I am because of who they are and where they have been. I have come to deeply appreciate the sacrifices and the hard work of my family to give me the opportunities, the privileges, the comfort that they never had and might never have. I have come to honor my grandfather's humanity. As a grandfather, a father, a husband, a man who loved the best that he knew how. He will be remembered and defined by much more than that one mistake that landed him in prison. My aunt, who was kidnapped and forced into an abusive marriage, was way more than a victim. She was a survivor who prophetically and courageously disrupted the empire's narrative in her life and the lives of her family. She brought her husband and four children to the Lord, and the family started dreaming a different kind of dream. My maternal grandmother was my one safe refuge growing up. And growing up in a misogynistic culture, she became the property of her husband at a young age and dutifully raised seven children. And as a peasant girl who was never given the opportunity to go to school, she has taught me what our school education could never teach. Without one single verbal instruction, she has managed to teach me in ways no seminary degree could. The abiding, sacrificial love of our Creator and how we ought to relate to each other. Now, all these family members have passed, but their voices they continue to defy for me, defy the empire's narrative of success, of influence, of power, of wealth, of privilege. In the face of the empire's narrative and dream for us, we disrupt it by remembering, by honoring where we came from and who we came from. We remember our call to collective flourishing as kingdom family, across race, ethnicity, gender, class, kingdom family. That our well-being and our salvation is intricately tied together. I'm going to pray for us, and if you could pull up the next slide. I'm going to give you just some time to sit with what was spoken and to reflect on these two questions. In what ways have you been deceived by the empire's narrative and dream for you? And what do you need to remember in order to disrupt that narrative? and start dreaming differently. Let me pray for us. Creator, thank you. Creator, we remember your commands to us. Mm. 
We remember that we are family. And God, we repent and we lament of the ways that we have bought into the empire's lies. And that we have turned away from family. And that we have cursed in so many ways our own family and turn away from our kin. Lord, have mercy and have mercy on this land. Holy Spirit, will you come and remember with us? Lord, I ask that you would minister to us in this moment and you would speak whatever needs to be spoken to every heart here. That you would pierce, pierce through our defenses, pierce through to speak that word that is relevant to us that we need to hear today. We give you thanks for who you are and who we are created in your image. In Jesus' name.